Amen. Amen. Excuse me if I get emotional. Um, there was a time not too long ago when I I really didn't know where my life would end up. But amen, I was saying, you know, there was a, a time not too long ago when, and I mean not too long ago at all, and I'll share some things about myself. I need to speed it up, though I only got a little bit of time. Um, about five months ago, I wouldn't have been here. I would have probably been down a fifth of crown somewhere because that's how low my life had gotten. And I had sat there at times talking to the Lord in my failure and in my misery and thinking, Lord, surely maybe one day I'll, I'll serve you again, but there's no way you can ever use me. Surely there's no way you can ever use me for all the things that I've done and the places that I've gone and, and all the failures in my life. And um, one day he showed up. Amen. Amen. In the midst of my failure and my darkness and, and everything and he just swooped in. Praise God. And he began to tap on my heart. He said, okay, son, it's enough. Come back home. Yeah. And here we are today. It's, it hasn't been very long, but the Lord's been so gracious and he's been so good. And I was sharing with Jessica outside because I was hearing her talk about how she's experiencing this freedom and this love that she's never experienced. And I had just been sharing over the last couple of days with, a, with someone at work about this freedom that I have in my walk with God. I'm experiencing a freedom and a victory that I've never experienced. Love like I've never experienced. Things that I've never experienced in my life, even in the past when I had this mighty awesome revelation and knowledge and understanding of who Christ is and what He did and how that comes to me, how that works in my life. But today I'm experiencing something different. A different kind of freedom to the point that I, I told the sister, I said, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I feel kind of guilty. I feel kind of bad about this, this freedom that I'm, I'm experiencing because I know without a doubt that there's a lot of Christians and a lot of believers that aren't walking in this same freedom that I'm walking in. But I want to encourage you that if you're in that place, that you can look at me as an example and realize that it was nothing that I did except that it was God's grace and His mercy. And, and the only thing that has happened to me that I can think of is that all my flesh has been stripped. Amen. And I've lost all trust in self. That's good. I've lost all belief in anything that I have to offer to right. God. And my daily walk revolves around me saying, Lord, unless that you would hold me up, there's no way I can walk before you. Lord, unless that you would keep me, I will not stay. Given a chance, I'm going to run away just as Israel did in, in, the, in the wilderness as they kept turning their hearts from the Lord. But I said, Lord, if you keep me, like when you showed up and you got me out of that mess that you just got me out of again for another time. Because I've been a backslider a few times in my life. But there's something different this time. There's something different. Amen. And I, I just pray that this that the Lord has given me tonight, that by His Spirit, He would make it real in your heart and in your life. Because the truth of the matter is, I have nothing to give you except that it's Jesus. Amen. Man. That's all I have to offer. That's the only thing. And I, I had a message Monday morning. I didn't go to work and I was laying. I'm going to give a little background. I'm going to try to speed this up and go to work. Um, I was laying on my couch early in the morning I was worshiping the Lord I didn't have to go to work that day I had some other stuff going on and I was just worshiping the Lord and praising the Lord and saying Lord I need you to give me a word for your people I need something I mean I can get up and pick a scripture and preach it and teach it and and it's going to be a blessing because it's God's word amen Amen. God's word's a blessing but I said Lord I need a word from you and I felt like almost immediately he, he gave me something and I began to meditate and all, meditate on it all day Monday and I was meditating on it all day Tuesday and I was starting to just slowly piece it together. Last night, uh, my, wife's, my, my wife's dad had a stroke yesterday so we went to the hospital and uh, I got back home late and I went in the room and put on some music and I started working on this little bit of this message and I felt like I got it. I got it all put together just to... Uh, a few more things to button up and I'm on my way to work this morning. Amen. I'm in my truck and I'm worshiping the Lord. 
And I began to think about all of y'all. And I began to cry a little bit. And I said, Lord, how is it that I've only been going in this church about three months? Because that's really about what it's been. But yet I feel this way about these people. And he spoke to my heart and he said, because you're my son. And they're my children. Yeah, that's good. He said, because you're my son and, and they're my children and that's my love. And then immediately he put a verse in my heart. And I said, oh, Lord, here we go. Here we go. So I, I believe I got a word and I want to go with y'all. And I was specifically thinking about a couple of people. I thought about Brother Vince. He's out of here. But there's something about that brother that I, I just fell in love with him. And I was thinking about the story that he told us in, in, uh, in our little Sunday evening Bible class. He, um, we were talking about something and, and he comes walking in and I go and I give him a hug because it just makes me so happy to see him. And uh, he, he said something and I made the comment, well, brother, just wait till I give you a holy kiss like they said in the scriptures. I was making fun of something Lily had said one day. And uh, he, he said, oh, I don't know about that. And, and he made a comment. Y'all are laughing, he says. But uh, he said, but I went to a church sometimes and, and those men believed in kissing one another. And he said, sometimes it was like a make-out sex. <laughs> I, I just laughed. And so the other day I see him walk in and I walked up to him and I said. <laughs> and then I think his name's Brother Joe, that, that brother that sits back there. Yeah, And all of y'all are really a blessing, but. The Lord has placed the love in my heart. And I want to go, if you will, um, to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28. And you may not be able to understand quite where I'm going yet, but hopefully by the time we get there, you'll see what I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart. I'm going to read these two verses, and then we'll pray. Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28. And the Lord would say, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Father, we just thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your love. Father, I ask that you would send forth your spirit. For I know he's already here in the midst of this place. And that you would just take this word, Lord, and you would take a word and make it real to our hearts tonight, Lord God. Father, we ask that you touch every heart and every mind by your spirit, that your will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen. And I, and I titled this message, Am I His Disciple? Am I His Disciple? And I titled it like that because I feel like it's important that I ask myself that on a daily basis. And I feel like that it's important for you as an individual, if you're a born again believer, to understand who you are in Christ Jesus, what it is that God wants to do in his body and in his church, because we're part of a body. We have a local body here, but there's a, a worldwide body that he's building. It's not just us here in Patterson, amen, but there are other believers throughout Patterson, and there are other believers throughout, is this St. Mary Parish, yes. and throughout this parish, and Lafouche Parish, and St. Charles Parish, and in counties in Mississippi, and counties in Alabama, don't think that you're the only one, because God has a church that he's building, amen. Yes. and he wants to build a church full of disciples, something I learned years ago about that word disciple, that word disciple means a learner, yes, that's what it means. It means a learner. No, oh, using my phone here, excuse me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He said, learn of me. That's what the Lord said. He said, learn of me. I want to give you the criteria for disciple making. Teaching Jesus. Amen. It's simple. Laying out Jesus, yes. portioning out the lamb, Amen. portioning out the bread of life, for he is the bread of life. It's the duty of the minister to always seek to give the people Jesus. Yes. I have nothing to offer you if it's not Jesus. Amen. And your duty as a disciple is to be a learner of Jesus, to ever explore him, yes. to ever search him out. To ever seek to find out the treasures, amen, that you have that are hidden in Christ Jesus. Praise God. 
That's what God has called us to be. He's called us to be disciples and disciple makers. Amen. Learning of Christ and teaching of Christ. Amen. Um, I want to jump over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, if you will. And we'll go to verse 28 because I want to tie in a few things. John chapter 8 and verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, speaking of Calvary, speaking of him being crucified, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A couple of key things here that he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? Now, I want to bring an understanding to what that word is, uh, because many times we just think that that's the Bible. If we continue reading the Bible, we'll be his disciples. But that's not specifically what he's talking about, because we got to understand that the Bible wasn't even written yet then. As a matter of fact, as he's speaking, the Bible, there's someone pinning this down and there's someone writing this down so that later on the scriptures, I think it was some 60 years after Jesus would be crucified and resurrected before that the, the gospels were actually pinned, they say. So this wasn't there yet. So he's speaking of a specific word that's being given, a specific, a specific thing that he's talking about. So the question is, what is that word? What is it that he's, that he's laying out? What is it that, if you continue in that, you'll be his disciple indeed? What is it that, if you continue in that, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free? I'm here to tell you that it's not religion. It's not routine. It's not this church, and it's not that church, and it's not Pastor Max preaching, and it's not Brother John's preaching and teaching, and it's not uh, this person's preaching and teaching, or that person's preaching or teaching, or anything of that sort. It's the truth. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the truth. Yeah. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man will come to the Father except that he comes by me, and it goes right back to the verses that we just looked at in Matthew chapter 11, where he told them about being his disciples. Where he told them about learning of him. Right? So we see that that's the word, it's the gospel message. The gospel message is the word that'll make you free, and the gospel message is the word that'll keep you free. Amen. You gotta understand that. It's, the power is in the gospel. Yes. Right. The power is in the gospel. Yes. The God, the power is not in it's, it's not in me or my routine or my regimen or any of that stuff. The power is not in my program or any of that. The power is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And if you'll come to know that and you'll come to walk in that, you'll begin to experience a freedom and a victory unlike anything that you've ever experienced you, in your life. The routines will be thrown out the door. The rules and regulations that you've made for yourself will be thrown out the door. The rules and the regulations that other people have tried to put on top of you will be thrown out the door. And you'll find yourself walking in a freedom, in a relationship with the Lord that's not based off of your performance daily, but rather it's based off of your knowledge of the fact that he has given you victory and freedom by your faith and your trust in who he is and what he did. Amen. The word of God said is by grace you are saved through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. Yet time and time again throughout my life since I've been very young, I've watched after as program after program and routine and routine and fad and this and that has entered into the church. 
Yes. Always ending up with some man getting glory and some man getting some boasting. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, no, that's not what it's about. It's about me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Yes. There's a rest in Christ that we can have. There's a rest in him that he wants to give you. There's a rest that is free, church. I'm here to tell you that you've got to see yourself for who you are in Christ. Yeah. The word says we are more than overcomers right. in him. Yeah. That's right. The problem is many times it's not really him that we're depending on. Amen. Oftentimes we're depending on ourselves. Yeah. We're depending on something we learned or something we heard yeah. that puts the name of Christ in it. But yet brings no real Christ. Paul would say it's another Jesus. Right. And it's another gospel. And the end result of this gospel is bondage. It's more of the piling up of the religious burdens on your shoulders. And it brings you to a place. I remember being in the ministry years ago. As a matter of fact, 2010, I think, was the first time I preached. And you know what? The first time I preached was at the little Bible study right over there in Bayou Vista. The first time I ever preached was at that little Bible study. It seemed like I've come full circle to this place where I'm at now. But I remember being just so full of life, so full of love, so full of victory. And some, somewhere along the way, I lost all of that. And my Christianity became a burden. It became a work. And it was no longer about me and Jesus. And it was about me and people's expectations. It was about me and the burden that I was carrying to live up to the expectations I had set for myself in front of people. And slowly it became a burden that I couldn't bear. Because no longer was I depending solely on Jesus Christ, who he is and what he had done. I had gotten my eyes off the master. I began to look at myself. And what I didn't know was just like Peter, I was sinking. And I was fighting and I was trying to, to stay above the water and stay above the waves. But I just kept sinking and sinking and sinking until I had sucked so far that I didn't even know where I was anymore. I remember being out in the world in the midst of the things that, well, even before that, I remember crying out to God at times, saying, Lord, I need you to come and get me. I need you to come and find me, Lord, because I don't even know how to get back to you. I can't even see you anymore. I don't know what has happened to me. I don't know what's going on, Lord. I, I was so in love with you at one time. I was so thrilled with this relationship we had, but now it's gone, and I don't know how to get back. I don't know where it is. I don't know how to find it, and that's what religion does to you. Amen. It burdens you down, and it loads you up, and it makes you sink, but Jesus will make you so light that you can step out, and you can walk out on the waters of life. Yeah, and you can stay above the waves and you can stay above the seas and even if it looks rough you can still find yourself walking on top of those things yes. even when it looks like you might go down when you learn how to walk in Christ and rest in Christ you'll find yourself walking yes. above those things Yes, Robert I'll spend most of my days with a smile on walking around work singing praises to the Lord Looking for any opportunity to interject a little bit of Jesus somewhere into some situation or conversation. One day I was walking around and there was someone of another faith that I don't want to go too deep into it, but basically what I said is when I walked away, I spoke to the Lord and I said, Lord, how will people know that? His Jesus and my Jesus are not the same Jesus. Because I don't want people to think that, that my Jesus looks like that. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, they'll know by what they see. Yeah. Amen. They'll know by what they see. Monday I missed work. And Tuesday I was walking around work. And I must have had about 30 or 40 people just stop me throughout the day and say, where were you yesterday? Where were you? 
We missed you. Is everything all right? Where where were you? Some a lot of a lot of Spanish people that we can barely communicate, but we find a way, right? And I had a thought throughout the day. I said, Lord, this is the joy that you've placed in me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the joy and the freedom and the victory, I believe, is, is overflowing out of my life and, and it's being seen. Amen. I believe that with all of my heart. And I'm so thankful. And I'm so grateful. I'm so happy for that. That you know what? I, I've found once again the joy, Lord, of thy salvation. The joy of thy salvation. And I want to encourage you tonight that no matter where you are or where you might find yourself, the, the joy of the Lord's salvation is still there. Yes. You know, I look back in these last six years of my life and man, it's been wretched. I've destroyed some things. I've messed some things up. I lost my family. I've I had a child out of wedlock, a lot of serious failure. I've, I've lost a, a, a really good job because of alcohol. But through all that and where I am now, I look back and I say, surely, Lord, you didn't, you didn't rejoice in that place that I was. <coughs> but what the enemy meant for evil, yes. God has turned it around. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. He's turned it around see the compassion and a love that he's built on the inside of me for brothers and sisters. I, I see this compassion always looking and, and being alert and being ready that if my brother or sister falls and, or they fell, that I'm not looking to see that so I can tell someone else. Oh, come on, come on. But rather I'm looking to see that because I've been there. Yes. And it hurts when you're down there. It hurts yes. when you're in failure and when you're in defeat and your life's a mess, and you don't know how to live for the Lord, and you don't know how to serve for the Lord, and everything you thought you knew, you just got to throw it away. Right. And you find yourself just crying out, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I'm lost, and I'm undone, and I'm a mess. Will you save me? Yes. Will you come and get me? And, and what you're going to realize is if you're there, or you're almost there, you're finding out that you're in the place that he wanted you to be to begin with. That's right. Like a little child, he said, suffer not the little children. Every time I see the little kids come up here. Amen. In my heart, that's that's what I think about. Is suffer not the little children yes. to come unto me. Yes. We would be so much better off, church, if we just came to him with little children. Right. Each and every day of our life. That we would walk towards him as little children, just dependent on who he is, just dependent on what he's done, just depending yes. on what he yes. wants to provide us with. Right. Do you understand that he died yes. to give us that? Amen. That victory, that freedom. I've never experienced freedom, church, like I'm experiencing right now. Praise God. And I love it. Amen. It feels so good. Amen. It feels so good. It, it's not it's, it's not a place of where if I've, I, I have a failure, and I do have many failures, but a place of if I have failure, that all of a sudden I'm beating myself up and I'm in condemnation, thinking that, oh, the Lord must be upset with me. He must be angry with me. And now I've got to try to make him happy with me again by doing this or doing that or doing this or doing that. A lot of times I'll just say, Lord, you knew what I was when you found me. You knew what I was when you decided to love me. Thank you, Jesus. You knew what I was when you made your way. To Calvary. The word of God says that while we were yet sinners. Yes. While we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Yes. While we were undone. While we were in all of our sin. He died for us. Thank you, Jesus. So let me ask you this. And I'm not promoting failure and sin and defeat. I'm just, I'm just acknowledging that it's a fact. Yeah. It's a fact in our lives. That every single person in here. Who has served the Lord for any amount of time, you found yourself in failure. Yeah. You found yourself in defeat. You found yourself in low lows. And you've probably also found yourself in high highs. And the high highs are great. But when you find yourself in the low lows, and you're looking up and you're laying on your back and you're saying, Lord, what happened? Yeah. Lord, where did it go wrong? It's a painful place to be. 
But this freedom that I have when I do find myself in some of these failures here in my life, no longer do I look at myself. I just look to the Lord. Amen. That's good. I just look to the Lord and I realize this is this is who I was. This is who I've been for 40 something years, the majority of my life. This is what I was. But I'm also seeing a new creation. Yes. Amen. There's a new creation. I, I'm new in Christ Jesus. He's, he's created a new creation. Yes. And he's doing something inside of me. He's giving me a victory. Yes. Amen. He, he, my thoughts. Uh, in my, when you can have victory in your thoughts. Amen. I don't know about y'all. But I've been living with this dude for 43 years. <laughs> and he's been having some messed up thoughts for a long time. Brother Larson used to say all the time. You know. God forbid they can put a screen up and play our thoughts in our head yeah. as we're sitting here. The different thoughts that we have, uh, not only just about ourselves, but about one another. <laughs> Amen. About about one another. Oh, there goes Pastor Matt getting loud in tongues again. <laughs> Praise the Lord in tongues. <sighs> Amen. That, that's, that's the kind of thoughts we have about one another sometimes. I'm going to pick on him in Yeah. You know, he, he don't mind if I pick one. Plus, I'd have to beat him up. So. <laughs> but the thoughts that we have, right, our, our, our thoughts, and, and, and many of the, the battles that we face are right here. They're in our mind, but I should really say they're, they're in our heart. Because that's the mind that I'm addressing, that I'm talking about. The, this, this heart that we have, this fallen nature. Amen. But I want to tell you that there's freedom. I want to go to the book of St. Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, I still have plenty of time. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to look at a couple of things real quick. And I believe I'll get to where I want to be. We'll start at verse 1. The apostle writing. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you... Or letters of commendation from you. What you'll find about the Apostle Paul in many of his letters, he never really puffed up himself in the fact that I'm an apostle. I'm this or I'm that. He would use those terms at times when he had to bring correction. When people were coming against who he was and, and saying, don't listen to this guy, the Judaizers would come behind him. And then he would have to sometimes let them know who he was, what he's been called to, that he's an apostle and things like that. But it wasn't something that he just carried around throwing at everybody that I am the apostle and, and, and I'm going to be in charge of things. That's not how, how he worked. But he's saying, is that what I need to do? Do I need to let you know who I am? Do you need a letter of commendation? He said, you are our epistle. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, Ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Who also hath made us able ministers... Of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Yes. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And what he's doing here is he's contrasting two covenants. He's contrasting two new two testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Earlier, I made the statement that what Jesus was saying when, when he talked about uh, abiding in his word, that he wasn't specifically talking about just reading the Bible, which is great. I encourage you to do that. You'll get to know a lot about Jesus. You can become a disciple Amen. that way. Amen. But what he was talking about was the gospel message, right? And the reason we know that is because... The law also is in the word of God. And he's not telling you to abide in the law. He's not telling you to abide in the old covenant. He's telling you to abide in the gospel. Abide in the word. Abide in the spirit. Don't go back to the letter of the law. Because 
That'll bring nothing but death. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I want to jump down to verse 17. He says, now the Lord is that spirit. Yes. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Jessica was talking outside and she was talking about two things. Love and freedom. Yes. Love and freedom. Love and I just started giggling. <laughs> because that's the, the, the gist of my message tonight is love and freedom. And I'm about to really get to the love. But I want you to know and understand that you have freedom tonight in Christ Jesus. Yes. You, that you have liberty tonight in Christ Jesus. Right? That there's victory in him. Yes. But don't let that freedom or liberty be an occasion to cause your brother or sister to stumble. Come on. Amen. See, and this is where you really start to grow in this walk. Because when you start to experience this freedom and liberty, he'll start to teach you some things. And he'll really start to dig down into your heart. You know, and I, I, I think about this all the time with Brother Larson. He would always say, yeah, you know, in, in, in three months or six months, whatever it was, or a year, however long it was, he said, the Lord got rid of the, the Xanax and the, the cocaine and the alcohol and the cigarettes and the tobacco. He did all that in like six months. He said, and then he started on the hard stuff. Yes. 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 Then he started on the hard stuff. Yeah. The backbiting. The, God, the gossiping. Uh -oh. The looking down on one another. The, the not esteeming ourselves as low as we should. The Word of God says that we should esteem ourselves lower than our brothers and Come sisters. On. Yes. Come on. That we should look at them as they are higher and more important than ourselves. Why? Because that's who Christ is. Yes. That's what he did. That's right. The darling of heaven. Yes. Left. Emptied, emptied himself of his deity. He, he never lost possession of it. He kept it the whole time. But as he walked on this earth. It was never that. That he used to do what he did. He did it as a man anointed yes. by the Holy Ghost. Yes. The same Holy Ghost, listen to me, that lives in you and I. Hallelujah. Right. Come on. The same Holy Spirit that lives in you. The same one that wants to give you victory and freedom in your life. The same one that wants to fill you with love. Yes. And that's where I want to bring this message to and make this transition to right here. I want to go real quick if we can actually let me let me talk about a couple of things real quick yeah still early for the time in Luke chapter 14 verses 26 and 27 the Lord Jesus Christ would, would make this this statement basically he would say that if you're not willing to hate your father your mother your wife your children your brother your sisters and even your own life that you can't be his disciple. Mm. Did you hear what I'm saying? I'm talking about the God of love. If you're not willing to hate your mother and your father and your, your brother and your sisters and your wife and even your own children, you're not a, you're not, you're not, you can't be his disciple. Mm. So is, is he promoting hate? Because God is love. No, that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying when it comes to you and him, that there can be nothing more important. That's right. right. It's you and him first. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's good. It's you and Jesus first. And what I've come to find out is in my marriage, in my short marriage, because it hasn't been very long, but in my marriage, that if John, not my wife, if John will look at the scripture and see what the scripture says about me, that I as the husband am supposed to love my wife as Christ loved his church. And he gave himself willingly for that church. If I will concern myself with my part of that and be truthful and say, Lord, mm. I'm not doing that. 
Lord, I, I come short of that every single day. But I know you can. Yeah. I know you can. And, and if I will pursue that individually, guess what? I don't really need a marriage counselor. I just need the Holy Ghost. I need to be honest with myself, yes. with my walk, with my relationship with the Lord. Am I am I doing this? Not, well, I'm not doing this, but she's not doing her part. Come on. No, there was a time, I believe it was, was Simon Peter, after he had felt the Lord, he, he, he felt the Lord, and the Lord restored him, and... He's talking to the Lord, and the Lord tells him, basically telling him that he's going to die for the gospel. And then here comes John, the one that Jesus loved, walking up. And John says something, he asks a question, and Peter, he, he turns to Jesus, he said, well, what about this man? Yeah. And Jesus basically said, don't you worry about him. Yeah, come on. If I want him to live until I tarry. So then the, the scripture says that it began to go around that, that Jesus said that, P, that John is not going to die. But then the scripture is clear. The Holy Ghost made it clear to put in there that that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that if it was his will, that's what it would be. Amen. What was Jesus telling Peter? Peter, stop looking at John. That's right. Start looking at me. Yes. Start looking at what you and I have going on. Husband, stop looking at your wife. Come on, come on. Start looking at Jesus and what you, what you and him have going on. Come on. Wife, stop looking at your husband and start looking at you and Jesus and see what y'all have going on. And make sure that that's working out. I can assure you if that begins to work out, that even if this ain't working out, Everything's going to be just fine. Praise God. Oh. If I can get this straight, all of this is going yes. to fall in place. That's the Word of God says, Seek ye first right. the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and He'll add to you Praise all God. of these things. But we are so quick to get our eyes on our brother or our sister. What's going on in their heart? What's going on in their life? How they worship the Lord. How they don't worship the Lord. Well, they don't worship the Lord as loud as I do. And they don't raise their hands as high as I do. And they don't, they don't cry as much as I do. I know I'm not the only one. Come on. That's right. Come on. We're human. And these are thoughts. This is part of the fallen nature because we're prideful. And we like to think ourselves more than what we really are. On, and every time those thoughts come into our head, every time those thoughts come up from our heart, what we should be doing instead of allowing them to fester and build on yes. the inside of us and, and leaving and going and chattering with one another about so and so or whatever, we should be bringing that to the Lord and saying, that's not right, yes. Lord. It's not right in me. I should not be concerned with if so and so has pride in their heart. I should be concerned with what's going on with you and I, Lord. Yes. I need to take care of this. Lord. Amen. Let me keep my eyes focused on yeah. you, Lord, and you take care of them. You have your relationship with them. You do what you want to do in their life. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's good preaching. And I guarantee you, if we would learn how to do that as individuals, between us and the Lord, oh, the body of Christ. Yeah. Who could stop us? Yeah. That's right. Who could stop it? Nobody. You see, but I do believe that in this last day that what the Lord is doing is that He is really working on his body. Because I believe he's coming back, and I believe he's coming back soon. I believe he's coming back for a glorious church that's without spot and without wrinkle. Yeah. A church that knows how to live for him. A church that knows how to surrender to his will and to his way. It's important. His way is important. Yeah. You can't surrender to his will if you don't surrender to his way. Come on, brother. A church that, that has learned how to surrender to his way, and because of that, they're surrendering to his will. That's good. A church that has love one for another. Amen. Because that's the true church. Amen. Amen. So he says also, he goes on in verse 27 and says that if you do not bear your cross and follow after me, you cannot be my disciple. Now I just want to bring some clarity to that real quick. I want you to understand what that cross is. I want us to have a little understanding of what that is because growing up, I've heard so often about these different crosses that people bear. And somebody would talk about this struggle they had in their life and they couldn't get rid of it and this and that. And, and then I heard an old Christian brother say, well, 
I guess that's just your cross you got to bear. You just got to bear that cross, that struggle that you're dealing with, that alcoholism that you're dealing with, that addiction that you're dealing with. That's just your cross. You just got to learn to, to take it up and carry it and, and just don't let it, don't let it subdue you. Just get her done, son. What did Max used to say? His daddy was a, just pull them up, pull up the bootstraps, huh? And get it done. That's not true biblical Christianity. That's right. The word of God says there's victory yeah. and there's freedom yeah. and there's liberty yeah. in Christ Jesus. Yeah. There's a rest that he has for us. There's a rest that he has for us in Christ. That's biblical Christianity. That's what separates true Christianity from every other religion out there. That's right. Every other religion says, you do something for me and I might be happy with you. <clears throat> the word of God says that in your flesh dwells no good thing. That's right. That's right. But if you'll trust in me, I'll lift you up. Yeah. And I'll make something beautiful yes. out of you. I'll do a work in you. I'll perform in you. I'll cause you to walk up right before me. So what is that cross that he's talking about? Galatians 6 and 14. The apostle Paul. Said our glory only. In the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By which I was crucified unto this world. And the world crucified. To me. He, he would identify himself with Calvary. He understood. He told us in the book of Romans that it was at the cross where he became one with Christ. That it was at Calvary where he was married to Jesus. Do you understand that a marriage took place? Yes. A union took place. The altar. Do you know what the altar typifies? It typifies Calvary. Every altar in the Old Testament that was ever built up was a typification of Calvary. Yes. Every single one. At the altar of Calvary, your Savior would make his way there and he would make his way there for a purpose so that he could lay down his life. But not only that, so that he could lay down his life physically, but that you could lay yours down and become one with him. That you could become married to him at Calvary. That you could become buried with him and then raised up into newness of life. What are you saying, preacher? What's this about the cross? What I'm saying, what you've got to learn to understand, and it's it's a lot easier to say it than it is to do it. Yes. It's not a very easy thing to do because it goes against everything that we are. It goes against all of our flesh. What the Spirit of God wants to teach us to do is to surrender ourselves to the work of Christ at Calvary. To surrender ourselves to that. To believe and trust in that what he did for us at Calvary is sufficient. Yes. That it's enough to provide us with everything that we have need of. Did you hear what I said? Everything that you have need of. Our husband, because that's what he is. We're the bride and he's our husband. Yes. Yes. We're married to him. We've become one with him. Marriage on earth is nothing more than a typification, the Bible tells us. The Apostle Paul tells us that it's a type of... Of the real marriage between Christ and his church. Amen. We become one with him. He's our husband. He is our provider. Yes. Jehovah Jireh. Yes. My provider. Yes. He is your provider. Right. Yes. Take up your cross, church. Hallelujah. Look to Calvary. Look to your union with him. Fight to believe. Did you hear what I said? What did Paul tell us? He said... To fight one fight. Good fight, good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. Fight the fight of faith. Fight to believe that Christ is sufficient. Yes. Fight to believe that who he is and what he did for you is enough to provide you with every single thing you have need of. But, but what do I got to do? What do I got to do? I got to do something. I got to do something. There. There's something I got to do. There's a part I got to play. You got to believe. 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 Amen. Believe. Yeah, no, there's more than that. i got to do something. There's something else. i, I got to do something. Believe. Hey, believe. Okay, well, I'm believing, but things ain't happening. And it's not working like I should. Egypt's looking good now. I missed the leeks. I missed the onions. <laughs> what should I do? Believe. Yeah. Believe God. 
Believe God. Listen, if you're if you're going to walk in a place of faith, you best believe that your faith's going to be tested. Right. It's not just going to be, oh, I believe that everything's perfect now. It doesn't quite work like that. It's not just a, a little formula that you, you rub a little, a little thing and you think everything is going to, well, I know what to believe now and everything's going to be perfect. No, you're going to have to fight to believe. Yes, that's right. You're going to have to fight to believe, but I'll, I'll tell you this much. If you'll hold on. Yes. If you'll hold on, don't be like the ones who were left behind in the wilderness and they didn't get to see the promised land with Joshua and Caleb. Don't be like the ones that didn't believe in God, that didn't trust in God. Don't be like them. Believe in God. Believe in his plan. Believe in his way. Don't let any slick-tongued preacher talk you out of believing fully in who Christ is and what Christ did. That he's not enough. And they won't say it like that. That's what you got to understand. They won't say it like that. And they'll say he is enough. At the same time, trying to give you another way right. to add to it. You've got to watch out. Let me get to the end of my message. I'm almost halfway there. <laughs> this is the verse. This is my message right here where we fix to go. John chapter 13 and verse 31. Because this is the verse. These are the verses that the Lord put on my heart this morning in that truck. Am I boring y'all? No. Yeah. Amen. See if I can catch y'all like Brother Solomon call somebody. What do they, what they say? If, I, if I'm making you angry, say amen. I heard somebody say amen. <laughs> That brother preached a message this weekend. Yeah, yeah. If you didn't get a chance to listen to it, you need to go listen to yeah. it. John chapter 13 and verse 31. Therefore, when he was going out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Let me read that again. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall men know that you are my disciples if you speak in tongues. <laughs> By this shall men know you are my disciples if you are able to preach the gospel. No. I can, by this shall they know you're my disciples if you lay hands on the sick and they recover. No. no. Oh, come on, we're getting into some deep stuff. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Love one to another. This is a true agapao love, an agape love, if you will, a God love for one another. I've encountered a lot of Christians that don't have much love for their brother or sister. I've been one of those Christians at times. But a true God love, when your relationship is right with the Lord, and when he's having his way in you, when the preacher's preaching to you and you're amening for yourself and not for your brother or sister across the church, when you're focused on yourself and your walk with God, and he's able to move in you and, and create that freedom and liberty in you, you'll learn how to esteem yourself lower than others you'll begin to realize how much more important they are than what you are. It'll begin to bring you down to a place to where you care about them in a way that you just can't understand. Amen. That's good. You know, I've never really seen this, and it wasn't until today that I've seen this, and I'll share a little... We can go a little past eight. I gotta wake up at three something, so y'all can bear with me. <laughs> Is that okay? Just a, a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> It was recently that, and I shared this in one of the Bible studies. I haven't been married very long to my wife, obviously. But we had a little spat one night. It wasn't nothing major, but I was right. 
And she was right. Have you ever been there? When y'all both were right? Amen. We were both right. She said, I'm going to bed. I said, good, I'm staying here. She went to bed. And she was asleep. And when I figured she was probably asleep, I said, all right, I'm going to get in the bed. I'm not sleeping on this hard couch. So I went and I got in the bed and I turned my back to her, which is not usually what I do. I turned my back to her and I said, I'm not holding her. And the Lord spoke my heart. And he said, who are you? All the times that you fell me and you've fallen. All the ways that you have spat on me and done this and that. And yet every time I was so willing to just come right back and pick you up. Who are you to treat her that way? I said, Lord, forgive me. And I turned over and I put my arm around her. And I, and I wept. I cried a little bit. I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Because your word says I'm supposed to love her like you love me. And the Lord, unless you do that in me, it's impossible. Yes. And today when I was reading this, I realized the same way that the Lord is telling me to love my wife, that he's telling me to love my brothers and sisters as he has loved me. Yes. That's what he said. By this, they'll know you're my disciples. If you have love one for another. And he, he said the commandment. Let me read it again. That you love one another as I have loved you. I want to ask you something. Is that the love that you have in your heart for God's people? Do you see that love being manifested in your life? I'm not, I'm not trying to heap condemnation or guilt, but I'm trying to ask you to evaluate yourself. Just as I have to evaluate myself. Do you see that in your life? Is that taking place? You know, in the, the book of Corinthians, I can't remember if it's first or second, but the Apostle Paul, he was, can someone come up and play some music? Is that okay? I don't know that we, if we necessarily need music or not, but I'm fixing the clothes. But the Apostle Paul, when dealing with the church at Corinth, Corinth he would talk about the spiritual gifts and, and speaking in tongues and prophesying and, and, and healings and all these things and and he would tell them to covet the gifts. Covet the best gifts, he'd say. Desire to prophesy. Covet that. But then he would say, I'm going to show you a better way. I'm going to show you a better way. And that's when he would go into love. That's whenever he would go into yeah. charity. And I want, to, I want you to ask yourself, is that love being manifested in my life? Do I see that taking place? Is there a love being... No, I'm not asking you if you're there, if you're perfect. I'm just asking you, do you see that love? Do you see hints and portions of that love being manifested in your life? And in my closing, I'm going to go to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. One of my favorite sections of scriptures... And I'm going to start at verse 1. He said, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain, vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that's what he's asking the you tonight, church. He's saying, will you humble yourselves? 
when you find yourselves becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, will you surrender yourselves to that work? Will you esteem yourselves lower than what your, your mind tells you you are? Will you, will you esteem your brothers and your sisters higher than yourselves? And I'm going to skip down to verse 12. Let's stand. And the apostle would say, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Why did you read that, Rachel? Because in working out your salvation, what you've got to realize is that what's supposed to be taking place is that the Spirit of God is supposed to be moving and operating on the inside of you. That He's supposed to be having His way on the inside of you. And the Apostle Paul is saying, evaluate your salvation. Is this taking place? Is God working both in you His desires and the power to accomplish these desires? I can only answer that for myself. And it will take each and every one of you here tonight to ask yourselves between you and your God, what's going on in your relationship with Him. As they play whatever it is they're going to play, and we can worship the Lord and if anyone needs prayer for whatever it is, as Matt always does, we'll open up the altar.